Welcome to Building Trust with Podcasting. I'm Pramod Sharma. Each year Edelman pre uh, prepares a trust barometer, and the latest one just came out days ago, or I guess a few weeks ago. If you look at the world, and you look at the sectors that are least trusted, then financial services is at the bottom once again. Like, it's even lower than banks. Now, I'm an actuary, which means that I'm in the world of financial services, and so if people don't trust the sector, then that's a bit of a problem. So in my case, I focused on insurance, which has its own set of issues. Uh, the Globe and Mail did some investigation some time ago saying that advisors are really supposed to be working for the clients, but there are commissions and other incentives that maybe get in the way of that. And then they went on to say that these create conflicts of interest, which isn't really a good thing. So in my case, I've spent years helping advisors find ways to be more trustworthy. And if the ideas work in financial services, then they'll also work in other sectors where people uh, don't have the same kinds of issues. And podcasting is an element of building trust, as we'll see as we go through in this session. We've already started this session, so in the beginning we'll just have an overview. The bulk of this session will be following the unconference participation aspect, where the idea will be that people ask questions and then we discuss them as a group. And then we'll have a wrap up and we'll finish everything on time so that we're uh, on track for our schedule. Trust. Today, trust is a big issue. We tend to distrust more than trust. So there was a time when doctors were used to advertise smoking. But we won't really trust doctors on smoking or other things these days. There was a time when celebrities were used to advertise smoking. And we tend to not trust them much anymore. And there was a time when we relied on statistics, when the authorities and celebrities weren't quite right. And now we question the statistics also, the sources, etc. So we're in a world where distrust is a big factor. And the ch question is that if there's so much distrust, then what is it that would cause people to want to trust you or me? There's a new prescription for trust. Trust consists of three different elements. First of all, there's chemistry. The other person needs to like you, because if they don't, then the rest doesn't really matter. There are so many choices nowadays that that's a good place to start off. Another element is credentials. This doesn't necessarily mean designations, but it means having the experience so that people can see that you can do the work that you are uh, claiming to be able to do. The challenge is that there are many people with the same, or from the client's point of view, a comparable level of chemistry and credentials. So it's like a Coke, Pepsi kind of thing. You may have a preference for one, but it's unlikely that you would walk out and go to another place just because they didn't serve the brand that you preferred. The last element is the one that makes a difference, and that's congruence. And this has to do with you showing that you're walking your walk, you're consistent, you're in harmony with what you say. And this is where social media can be a big element, including podcasting. Now, what you need to do to continue to show congruence is a steady source of fuel, so that way that you can keep aloft. And one way to do that is by ongoing visible proof, and social media is a way to demonstrate that. Now, there are different mediums or media that you can use, and what you pick can be based on what you like. If you like to talk, then podcasting is a good option for you. If you like to show things, then YouTube is an option that you can pursue. And if you prefer to write, then blogging is an option. Now, here's the thing. Since we're at PodCamp, it could be that you prefer podcasting over the other choices. The question is whether that's the medium that will build trust the most in your target market. Because sometimes what we like isn't necessarily the same as what our target market would prefer. And we'll just look at some samples of success because I want to show you that the things that we've been, uh, that we'll be looking at are things that I've actually been using and have achieved some results with. Now I'm recording this session, so if the quality turns out to be good, then what I'll do is I'll post it online, and that way, and also this, the slides, etc. So that way, you can have a copy of this.
under the Creative Commons type of approach that we use at these unconferences. So this is what happened last year. I got interviewed in the Toronto Star and then also in the Globe and Mail. I got invited to speak at a conference that I'd wanted to speak at for many years. You may not have heard of this conference, but you may be aware of some of these speakers. So Ted Rogers was a speaker at the very first version of this conference, which was uh, 21 years ago. Uh, he's not with us anymore, so last year it was his son Ed, people like Mitch Joel, etc. And so I got invited to that based on the kinds of things that we're talking about today as mechanisms. Toronto Board of Trade, they have an annual Business Excellence Award, and last year there were 49 nominees in eight categories, and there was only one person from financial services. Now, I ended up losing, but that's okay, because it turns out the grand prize in this contest was that UPS would ship you to Paris in a box, and so I think I'm okay not having <laughs> won that particular contest, but it was nice to be considered. And it just shows that the, there are things that you can achieve just doing simple things when people can see what you are doing and believe that what you're doing is of value. Now, I have been podcasting for about three years. I do one a week, and so there are about 150 episodes. Now, do you think that those successes came because iPods come in so many shapes and colors? Do you think it's because journalists have no deadline, so they can just spend hours and hours listening to podcasts and then investigating who they want to interview? Or do you think it might be related to blogs, where in, the sport, in, the, in just a few minutes, they can scan lots of different blogs? In the time that it takes you to listen to one podcast, how many blogs could you read? Hyperlinks are the currency of the internet. Do, blo do podcasts have hyperlinks. It's difficult for some of those things to work. Now, it could be that podcasting is the ideal mechanism for you because maybe you prefer talking, but you may find that that isn't the ideal medium for you to achieve trust. Now, this is where we'll have our discussion so that we can, because what I've seen in a lot of the sessions this weekend is that there's been a lot of presenting and people have just been sitting and taking notes. And the idea of an unconference is that we're here to participate. So do you have any issues or questions or things you wanted to raise relating to podcasting or other things? Because that would be something good to discuss. Yes? You must have some sort of agenda or plan for what you're going to talk about. Do you? Well, yes, I do. <laughs> you follow the script. You go from here to here to here to here. You kind of like free associate that. Oh, I, I can free associate. What I did is, in the program, I listed a bunch of questions that I thought people might ask. Uh, so if no one asks questions, then I can keep going for on for hours and hours. But that won't be as beneficial as questions that you might have. Yes? I, I would uh, like to ask a few basic questions about getting started. I have a blog, and I have uh, a number of followers, and I'm active in the community, but I haven't begun to do any podcasting yet. I've done some video on Vimeo. So uh, how do I get started? With podcasting? Yeah. Well, if you're already doing video, then the question would arise where podcasting fits in. If you look at Google, they own text with Blogger. They own video with YouTube. They haven't bothered doing anything with, tech, with uh, audio. So if you're already doing YouTube, then maybe you're already at a further level than you could get with podcasting. So you need to see what the purpose is. One approach that you could take, because I've done like 157 podcasts, but I cheat. What I do, because I've got a limited amount of time, is I read my blog post and I record that. And that's a podcast. So they tend to be about five minutes on average, right? because I write about 500 words a week. So that's one way that you could take the content you've already got. Now, if your videos are different than your blog posts, then what you could do is take the, unless they're like purely visual, what you could do is take the audio stream from your video, and now you have a podcast. You could have that video transcribed, 
and now you have a blog post. So if you can do video, which is the thing that I've had as my priority every year for the last two or three years, but uh, have never quite felt ready for it, then you essentially have the other ones. If you prefer writing, which is what I prefer, then you can create the other also, right? So the, the text is your, your blog, you read it aloud, so now you have a podcast, and then you read that to a camera, which may be dull, because people are just watching you talk to a camera, but now you have video. So once you have one of these, or it could be that audio is your natural preference, you just like talking, and then you can have that transcribed. There are tools like Dragon Naturally Speaking that do a pretty credible job of that. And when you're talking to the, like your tape recorder or whatever, you could just talk to a video camera instead. So there are different choices like that. But if, to get started, you don't really need much. You need a microphone. And a good quality microphone is a good idea because what I've heard in at least a couple of sessions and a couple of speakers this weekend is what I've read also, is that people will tolerate bad video, but they will not tolerate bad audio. <coughs> so if you get good equipment so that you can record, a USB microphone seems to work well because computers have poor sound systems built in. And so with the USB device, it bypasses your sound system. So you record that. There is free software called Audacity, which everyone seems to use if they're in the Windows environment. I think it works on Macs, but there are probably other tools in the Mac world. And then that's what you can use for the editing. If you're already doing video, then you probably know how to edit anyway. And if you're looking for a free place to host your podcasts, then, because a lot of people seem to use these paid services, and which again raises a question, why would anyone need to pay? Google is happy to, uh, to host text. They're happy to host video. So what is it about audio, which is something in between that people can't put somewhere without paying money? But there is a place, it's called the Internet Archive, and it's designed to be a repository, it's at archive.org. It's designed to be an ar a repository of human knowledge, and you can put your podcast there. That's where I host mine. So that way you don't have to worry that I'm going to stop paying a subscription and my stuff will disappear. Yes? Uh, I've been mainly writing over the past number of years, and I, but I do do some recording. So some of my gentlemen here to my right was asking about starting off. Uh, you said you basically read, you read your article, you said. You write the article and you read it. Is that what you do? So if I wanted to try it out, just do one and, and see how that turns out, just to kind of give it a, see what, what yeah, the response so is. Would you recommend that? Or if I'm writing, just keep on doing that and don't push yourself for somewhere you don't need to be at. For Everyone will have their own strategy, but I, I knew that I wanted to get to video someday. Okay. And I knew that from writing to video was a pretty big step. Okay. And I didn't want to do that in one leap. And I didn't really like the way my voice sounded and intonations, etc. Mm -hmm. And by recording audio, you tend to focus on voice. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know how to edit video. Okay. But if, what, if when you're editing audio, you're editing a waveform. And video is a waveform too. Mm -hmm. So it was a way to build skills. Some people are very good at speaking impromptu. Mm -hmm. So it could be that when you just put a camera in front of yourself, you have a few points you want to discuss and you can do that. That's yeah. another way that you could do it. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Other questions? My original question was actually not about planning this stuff, but planning the podcast stuff. But remember I asked about, you know, if you have a format. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so a format for creating a podcast? Yeah, do you, do you follow a format, or this is why I say, do you, or do you just add lib? What is your style? Okay, my style, and it may not be the ideal for everyone, is to work from a script. Okay. I found that, for whatever reason, that when there's a microphone in front of me, I can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and things, like I forget my ideas, et cetera. And I knew I needed to get over that, because if you, you can't, talk to a microphone, then how are you supposed to do audio or video? Right. What I did a little over a year ago is I joined Toastmasters. And there what you get the opportunity to do is practice impromptu speaking, where you're asked to speak for a minute about something that you know nothing about. And it seems like a really crazy thing to do, but what happens is when you practice that, then you get very comfortable at speaking about things that you do know about. So in the last year, I've changed the way I do presentations because normally what I would do, and this is very easy to do, is if we have an hour, then I would have, say, 
45 minutes of prepared content, right? So the audience just sits there and then they clap at the end. There's a few minutes for questions. These things usually start late, so you don't have a lot of time for questions, and then you just leave. What I've tried to do since I've been able to speak better, impromptu, et cetera, is to have the session so that they're unstructured. So what we had here was a very short introduction, and the rest of the session is magic based on what we do here. So different approaches can, can be used, or have I still not answered the question? No, I think you covered it. <laughs> Does anyone else have any yeah. suggestions on how to podcast or anything? Yes. Yeah. Well, I was wondering if we discuss uh, in more detail about how to build trust in uh, podcasting. Okay. Well, podcasting is simply a medium. So the way to build trust, and another formula to look at, this is from a book called Let's Get Real by Mahan Kalsa, is he, he defines trust as having two elements. One is expertise. And so that means that you can do the job. But he presupposes that the chemistry is already there. And that you can demonstrate on LinkedIn, for instance, right? So you, you've got your background, it shows that you, you've studied, you've got testimonials, all of that. But from a client's point of view, there are many other people who are close enough. The other element he defines as being important to trust besides the expertise is the intent, where you need to show that you've got your client's best interests at heart. And one of the ways you can do that, Seth Godin talks about consistent, persistent generosity. So you focus on doing things where they're not really sales oriented, they're just you giving things out. Now, say if podcasting is the medium you like, like I've got over 150. Now, it, that doesn't mean that everyone needs to listen to them, but the fact that you have so many and you've been shipping them on a regular basis helps build trust because it shows that you're reliable. Does that help? A bit, I guess. No, I was, I was hoping you would uh, maybe go in more detail with um, talking about those uh, slides that you had before. Okay, the one that was talking about the- Yeah, the, the, finan the financial sector. Um, okay, well let's- There was a lot of distrust in the financial sector. Yes. Um, I'm just thinking that from the viewpoint of the audience, they may not want me to redo those slides. So if you like, I'll, I'm happy to stay afterwards and we okay. can go into that in a little more detail, or it depends on other questions. Yes? I'd like to mention in terms of video that I found if you have a voiceover by a client, it's very good to make sure that they spend lots of time rehearsing, mm -hmm. and it's also very good to have a prepared script that's very, very tight, and that really makes it effective. Mm -hmm. If you simply have someone ad lib and talk about things. As soon as they see the microphone, you know, it's a different person. So mm. that's, that's something I found is very useful. Okay, that's good to know. Because I find even with audio, the microphone there can be intimidating. I agree. I mean, I had the same issue for a few years, but uh, I just went through practice. Just kept doing it and doing it, and I got better. I'm, more, I'm one of those impromptu guys. I can sure. get in front of a camera and do it. But I agree with you, there's some people yeah. just uh, get in front of a camera or see a microphone, and it's tough. And again, it's stepping out of your your comfort zone and, and, and knowing you want to learn how to do it and you stepped out and did the podcast and done a lot of them and you got better at it as, as you did. But I've seen some of them, they're awesome. So. Yeah, I would agree 100% with what you're saying. In terms of presentations, mm -hmm. often if we have a prepared script but we're able to ad lib for a part of that, the part that's ad libbed is going to be much more effective on video mm -hmm. than the part that is all, you know, word by word yeah. and everything is controlled. So I agree that after experience, it's possible to ad lib, and, yeah. but, but, but there's lots of clients who can't do that yet, and so it's good to have a very tight I script, agree. and they'll do this <laughs> fantastic. Oh, yeah, okay. So I, I everyone's happy. Yeah, yeah another approach I've yeah. heard is that you put the microphone down and yeah. you just start talking, and so after a while, the microphone becomes invisible, right. and you ask them questions, and then they yeah. answer them. And maybe you get the answers that way. So you've got, you, you provided the comfort level, and at the same time, it's unscripted. Yeah. And yesterday, someone was showing one of these snowball microphones where it, it just looks so cute, right? Yeah. Like, how could you not talk to someone like that? And you won't even notice it. It looks like it's also, going to fly. Also, this kind of a windscreen I've found really makes people much more comfortable. Otherwise, what you have is this. Uh. And it really <laughs> makes a big difference. It yeah. makes a big difference, and also it makes for much, much more effective yes. uh, audio in terms of any, any kind of a wind current, so that's all. 
That's oh, all part okay. of it. Uh, the tricks of the trade. Also, this is a standard broadcast mic. It's called a Zoom, a Zoom H4N, and it's about 300 bucks. It's excellent. It's just uh, absolutely excellent. Yeah, what I'm actually using for my video camera is the same kind of microphone system from Zoom. Yeah. But it's also got video. And so that way I've got both. It probably which, doesn't do the audio quite as well. Which model is that? That's, uh, it's the uh, Zoom Q3 HD. OK. So it probably yeah. doesn't do audio as well as yours, because yours is more sophisticated. But, it's got but I find this is yeah. a pretty good compromise. Absolutely. Some questions from this side? I just got a quick, quick comment. Um, you know, we're in the 21st century, and what you have to find out is what you like. Uh, some people may like wanting to get in front of a video and do what you're doing, or maybe want to do a voice over. Like I'm doing a podcast tomorrow with a friend of mine, and I'm going to feed him everything so he can just ask me. And we're we'll just having our phone conversation, so I'm even forgetting that we're even recording it. So, again, it's all about your comfort level and what you feel like doing. So, you've done both, and that's awesome. And people have to find that comfortable area where they can do it and they can be effective at it and, and go from there. So, Again, because yes. internet's changed a lot of things, and this is one thing that, that's great to see. Yeah, because I think there are podcast systems where essentially you just phone in, yep. and that's that way, if you're comfortable talking on the phone, as most of us have learned to be, mm -hmm. then you record that. I'm not sure how you do the editing, but yeah. maybe the editing isn't so much of a an issue when mm -hmm. you're just talking into a telephone. Yep. So different kinds of approaches. Yeah, there is. That's that's what I do a lot of with with other hosts. Okay. Yes. I did some coaching a couple of years ago of people for a, uh, what are those things, a, uh, a web, what do you call it, you're doing a, a webinar? webinar? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how you hold yourself is very important. You, you know, you can't slouch and you can't be like this. You have to like, sit up straight or stand up straight. <laughs> no, I mean, they, people really like leaning against the wall. Like they were down at the mall or something. And I said, stand up straight if you're going to be doing this standing up because your lungs and your nasal passages have to be in alignment so that your mouth moves <laughs> and your breathing has to be like, you know, you say a sentence and then you breathe. You don't sort of breathe in the middle of the sentence because, you know, it sounds like you're gasping. So this is all of the acoustics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of the issues I had in the beginning because yeah. I was terrified by microphones. And what I would do is I talk until I ran out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> then just <laughs> and then start and then and you can see in the waveform like they start <coughs> off okay and then they taper down and then <laughs> person's panting and then I just edit those out. <coughs> so to record my five to ten minutes of audio, I'd spend <laughs> like several times that length of time just editing things out. And I'm finding now that I'm more comfortable. I was talking to someone who's a speech coach and what she was saying is if you're intimidated by the microphone, pretend it's a head of, like a, a head of lettuce <laughs> or a cabbage. Yeah. And somehow that helps. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure why, but there are different issues that people may have. Does anyone else here do a podcast? Okay, Jim does. Okay. Um, also, one thing that uh, a friend of mine mentioned is that if you do video podcasts, Lighting is something that is mm. very important. Yes. Because yes. if you don't have good lighting, everyone complains. If you have good lighting, everyone's happy. It's <laughs> a part of it. It's true. Yes. With yeah. video, there are simply more parts that you need to worry about. Yeah. So you need to worry about like what you're wearing because there may be <laughs> a certain image you want to give across, the kind of lighting, etc. And so this year, I want to do a little more video because I think that's the ultimate in terms of of uh, building trust, etc. But it's just harder to do. You have to know how to edit and, and worry about many more things. Since you talk about good lighting, um, what do you mean by good lighting? By, lighting could be anything. by good lighting, I mean to have a couple of uh, spotlights which are diffused. I mean, they're pretty standard in in video, if you go to a place like this tech, for example, and just ask <coughs> for some good equipment, or even if you have some old equipment at home, but, but, but it's important to have some diffusion of the lighting, because if it's a big glare, it's not gonna work very well. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the kinds of things which I know from experience. If you have a bit of light, if someone's making a presentation, and you want to record that, it's really good to make sure that your lighting is good, and also, of course, that your 
audio is as, as good as you can make, you know, the, the mic placement and the setting of the mic, all those kinds of things are very important in the business. And that's where practice would come in. I did create a couple of videos a couple of years ago, just because I, I blog, so just introducing the blogs. And I didn't know much about lighting or much about anything. And so what I did is I went to Canadian Tire and I bought these like thousand watt halogen things. And like, th so there was a lot of light. I didn't realize that that wasn't just enough. And so I think there was glare and I, I was sitting on my chair and the back was visible as I was told by people who know how to do this stuff that, well, A for courage, but <laughs> 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 that's not really the, the way to, to do it. But at least I, I started somewhere. Yes. Uh, I actually bought a, a webcam uh, about four months ago, and um, I've been using that to do some video. Actually, the quality is actually really good, even on the, on the webcam. Um, I agree, you need some lighting, so I've had a little bit of success in just being on my own just to test it out. And so, even webcams are. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of, if they're about thirty, forty dollars, you can get a good webcam yeah. that has the camera and a little mic to pick up and your voice. Also, I found that in some cases, uh, if you have a presentation. It's good to have two cameras, you know, to have, and then afterwards edit the two shots, oh. especially if you have a talking head. And also, uh, there have been times where I've used uh, a, 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 uh, a digital camera, and the video, if it's, uh, if it's HD, is excellent, you know. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. no problem with that or whatever. In terms of online video, it works very well. somebody with that, you know, like, guitar. <laughs> 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 I haven't intimidated anyone yet, but I'm sure, I'm sure the occasion will arrive. <laughs> so the next question, has anybody tried the iPad then to use for making this video? Uh, I haven't, but a friend of mine has, and it actually looked really good. Yeah? Yeah, he did. He did. He did. He did. Sorry about that. It was just there. Oh, you know? <laughs> yes. It, it does work. Yeah. But you really have to have someone just to hold the, the iPad. Because <laughs> <laughs> they'll try much more iPads than I know of. So they hold the iPad. And also, a friend of mine has done extensive uh, podcasting with an iPhone you know, for years. Oh, really? And he finds that it's very effective. Wow. You know, for all kinds of interviews, all kinds of settings. Maybe it's not as effective as this is, but in terms of convenience and also <coughs> the lack of intimidation, yeah. it's uh, very good. Yeah. I have a friend that does that too. Uh, conferences, he gets his iPhone out there. He shoots his own videos. I see him do it. Sometimes they want to carry something big with you everywhere you go and just bring your camera with you. So. Yeah, the key thing is probably just to get started with whatever device you like. Yeah. And then over time, maybe if, if it's not of the quality you want or you can't do the kind of editing or other things, then that's an opportunity to, to maybe upgrade or try something else. Like my iPad doesn't have a camera, so I can't use it for, for video anyway. Yes. So, quick question. Um, I have a couple of clients that have come to me you know, that want to start you know, blogging and, and build a brand. What would you say to someone who say, came to you and said, well, you know, promote, I, I want to build my brand and I want to write and I want to do some podcasting. Is it just give them the education as to what your, what your experience has been or find out what they feel comfortable in and what you should lead them into? I find that People say a lot of things that they want to do, but when it comes to actually doing them, they mm -hmm. probably aren't going to continue. Okay. So what I advise people to do is start with something simple. Mm -hmm. So for instance, rather than creating content, which is a commitment of time, and mm -hmm. when you stop, then people aren't gonna trust you quite as much, right? Mm -hmm. You say that I'm a blogger or I'm mm -hmm. a podcaster, and then you've got a bunch of episodes, but you don't have any for the last seven months. Mm -hmm. right? That takes away a lot, and it's hard to erase things once they're online. A better way to start might be by sharing content that other people have created. Mm -hmm. So uh, you read something, and then you send a link to that out on LinkedIn mm -hmm. or Twitter, mm -hmm. and you get into the habit of doing that. So maybe you do that two or three days a week. Maybe just one okay. tweet or one update during that time. And that ends up being pretty easy to do. That would take, what, less than 10 minutes each day if you're just doing one update. And you'd have dozens, maybe hundreds to choose from. So the quality would be fairly good. Mm -hmm. And then when you start doing that, you see that, okay, this is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of, 
uh, 20 minutes a week on social media, what I'm willing to do now is dedicate an hour or maybe mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. And then if they look at the medium they like best, then that's a good way to start. Like, I, I feel that video is the best, but there was no way I could handle that. Like, it just was way beyond my comfort zone and abilities. I, I liked writing, and so I started with the blogging. Mm -hmm. uh, I see a lot of people, and they're really good at talking. They talk a lot all day. So maybe podcasting would be a really good choice for them, that they just record themselves. Because if it's something, it's like exercise, right? They're, first of all, you need to get into the routine, which is enough of a challenge. But when we exercise, there are certain exercises we may like doing. Some of us may like using machines. Other of us, others may prefer classes. But if we don't pick the form that suits us, then we're not as likely to stick with it. Mm -hmm. Now maybe later, if we get really good, then we need to make changes because we are trying to learn a certain skill and that does take some work. But to, to get started and build the momentum of okay. something simple seems like a good way to proceed. Okay. Well, I've, I've done that myself, but I never thought I'd maybe tell other people to do that. Never. I, I retweet like other articles, you know, from other authors. I do that, but I never thought of telling such a client to do that. It's, really it's a really easy way for people to get started. Yeah. And once idea. they start seeing that they have a following yeah. and they're getting retweeted, whatever, then yeah. they become more likely to mm -hmm. want to expand. Oh, but if great. they, because there's a feeling that we must be doing things, and then it becomes like a job. But if you yeah. do something simple and you start liking it, then it becomes almost a hobby, something mm -hmm. that's not torture. And then <laughs> you also find time for things that you like. Yeah. But in the beginning, people say, well, I don't have time to do this because my time is already busy doing everything else. Yes? Uh, Jim, for your, uh, your, your business clients, I mean, I have a sales background, and you know, what, what customers love talking about is I don't have them talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. I have them talk about issues in the marketplace that they see mm -hmm. or questions that come up from their customers. Mm -hmm. And be like, uh, I read this great book called Engage, and he said the purpose of your, your outbound social media for your company is to be a resource. Mm -hmm. So in being a resource, which is like the consistent, persistent thing, you're actually communicating that I know what I'm talking about, and I don't have to sell you because I'm actually selling you indirectly through presenting this stuff to mm -hmm. you. Tell me, don't tell me. Okay. Because right. yeah, we get paid in two ways. The first way is the tougher way these days. It's with attention. We've got so much distraction going on, so if someone takes the time to look at something you've done, whether it's a tweet or listen to a podcast or watch a video or read a blog post, that's huge. Mm -hmm. They have paid you. Yeah. Now, that isn't the same as dollars, but once you start getting paid in attention, you can convert that to getting paid in dollars. Mm -hmm. So if you look at what I did with the media, et cetera, like, it just built over time. Mm -hmm. right? But when you get in major publications, then that's earned attention, it's free. But if you advertise what you're doing or are too self-promotional, you're bugging people. They can sense that you're, you're doing things more for your benefit. You're not really congruent. You're not really looking out for them. And that's, because one of the questions that arises is monetizing and making money out of things. Well, making money is great, but maybe the podcast isn't the place to make the money. Maybe the podcast is the place that shows your generosity. And through that, like, I don't listen to any podcasts, for, but I've listened to several episodes of Mitch Joel's. Now, Mitch Joel's business is digital marketing, but he doesn't talk about digital marketing much. So on his blog, he's writing about different things. On his podcast, he's, he's basically interviewing different people. But you know what he does, and you get to like him because of these other things he's doing. Now, if all of his things were about what he sold, then you might be a little more skeptical because you know that, oh, it'll be about this. But if it's just good quality content, then we're paying him with attention, and then if you need the kinds of services he provides, then why wouldn't you consider using him? Yeah, because the monetization is a, is a big challenge. And another thing is that you could put ads various places but you may find that with ads, you don't earn a lot of revenue. And at the same time, maybe you're, you've got visitors and you're creating thousands of impressions. Like you're bugging like, people thousands of times with things and not getting much for it. You may find that you're better off by not having the ads. 
right? Because the way I look at these kinds of activities is as philanthropy. I'm not really big on donating money because I worry about how it'll get used, but time is even more valuable than money. Because if it comes to donating money, then we know that Warren Buffett and Bill Gates can, can give a, a little bit more than we could, right? They have a healthy lead. They have a healthy lead. <laughs> but if you look at the number of hours in a week, the 168 hours, well, we've got the same number that they do. And maybe if we're donating an hour or two, then we're giving more than they are in that sense. Mm -hmm. And so there are different ways that you can look at this, but if you look at what you're doing is you're donating your time to help others, then you have to be generous, right? Because you, you're thinking of your audience and what would be of value to them. And when you start doing those things and people can see that you really are helping people, then they get drawn to you. And what we do, chances are people need our services anyway. They've gotten to like us. They, the whole reciprocity angle has been used because we've been giving them things of value so they feel a debt of a sort. And maybe they would repay it if they need that kind of service by selecting you rather than someone else that they perhaps don't know or who hasn't been as giving as, as you have. So that's an indirect way to monetize. Yes? Well, you just talked about indirectly. Uh, last year, uh, I got approached, uh, to, uh, actually I got a job in the, for a paid speaking opportunity. The reason I got it indirectly because I did some, I've been doing some YouTube videos of my presentations. I had shared. They asked, could see some videos of my presentations in December, and then I got offered the job in January. All because indirectly, the work I was doing on uh, through YouTube and all that got me that job. So yeah, and that's an example. excellent way. Now, if you had created the videos with the intention of getting hired as a paid speaker, mm -hmm. then maybe it wouldn't have worked as well. Right. Because maybe there'd be some edge to it, or you'd be talking about how great you are. Or there'd be something that, because we're very good at sensing things. Yeah. Right? I mean, children in particular, right? So they, they can just sense, well, wait a second, you're telling me to eat broccoli and you're not eating yours, or uh, you don't sleep on time, why should I? Yeah. Right? So there, we have these very good senses of, mm -hmm. of uh, incongruence. Yeah. Questions from this side? Did you want to ask any questions? <laughs> no, Just been sitting calmly listening. <laughs> well, you know, you couldn't have a podcast if you had to have a listener. <laughs> <laughs> I think these this side is fulfilling its role. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely we need people to, to talk and we also need people to listen. <laughs> Though I've heard, and I don't know if this is a fact, but I've heard that the majority of people who listen to podcasts also create podcasts. So and some heard some of the things that bloggers tend to read other blogs. So there seem to be communities where maybe you're reaching people with a similar interest, but maybe not the target market that you are after. But there, one way that you can reach them is maybe they don't listen to your podcast, but they see that you've been doing podcasts. There was a speaker yesterday saying that his dad creates a podcast, but he never listens to it. It's too much work for him to download it with iTunes or whatever tool he's using. Or it could be that he doesn't like to listen to the sound of his voice, but he's creating this content and he doesn't use it himself, which seems a little odd, because if you don't listen to yourself, then how do you improve? He's he doesn't want to listen to his dad's podcast? No, his dad creates a podcast, and his dad doesn't listen to his own podcast. Oh, I see. Some people are, are, are uncomfortable hearing the sound of their own voice. That might be the fact. I, w I was at the beginning, and I got used to it. So. It sounds really different, right? It does. It does. It does. But you, me? Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, you're used to it after you, after you watch it a couple hundred times. Yeah, that's a big advantage of doing something like podcasting or writing or any of these things is that you do improve over time. And in the beginning, you may not be comfortable with how you are looking or sounding or writing, but you have to get better. Like yeah. you, you, you can't get worse if you <laughs> practice. And then when people see you, it's the latest state they're seeing. Yeah. Right? So when you've got all the refinement, they don't, it's like the overnight success idea, right? Yeah. You've done all your, your practice and you've improved, but if you had never started, then you'd still be at that level rather than at the higher level. Mm -hmm. 
And that's the 10,000 hour rule kind of idea of Malcolm Gladwell, et cetera, where to get good, it takes time yeah. and practice, and that's boring. But that's why it works, is because <laughs> it takes a commitment. If it was simple, everyone would be doing it. Yeah, but the thing is, in today's society, it's hard to specialize, because there's all this stuff you have to be kind of like, like Baldy Phil was good at. So the 10,000 hours is subdivided like 10 times. Well, it depends. The, the, does anyone have any comments on that before yes. I disagree? I would, I would say that uh, if you want to specialize in something, usually that 10,000 hour rule applies to a, a particular skill that you excel at uh, mm -hmm. to a phenomenal degree. It's not a matter of uh, being able to multitask and to do all kinds of things. That's my, my sense. Of course, uh, maybe other people might see it's another term. Well, you know, the, I'll, I'll add one thing to that. I mean, Malcolm Gladwell talks about the Beatles and where they practiced at a, at a, at a club there for, for 10,000 hours before they got popular. Yeah, yeah, so they did it over and over again. So by the time they came up with success, they already done it so many times. They it was good. And I think for speakers like myself, I've been speaking since 2008. I know I was bad. I saw that. I always watched the video. I knew it was bad, but I was going to get better. And I How had. I know you're still not bad. <laughs> I mean, I had my moments. I mean, hey, I was, take that outside, please. It was lady wide open. I, I, yeah, it's fine. And, but I'm, I'm big enough to understand that I'm going to keep on learning. And I think to answer your question about society, yes. But uh, I think that you have to realize what you're good at and keep focusing on it. And when you do that, you'll find your flow. And if you want to start writing, start writing. That's what I did. Then I, I, I grad, gravitated to video. And so. Like you said, about if my clients come to me, I'm gonna tell them to do maybe that example, post something else, get into the rhythm, and, and then do your own stuff down the road. Yeah. In my own experience, I've seen that the people who specialize seem to get further because when we have problems, we want them solved right. So for instance, if you have a leaky basement, then do you want to take the cheapest quote? Do you want to take the person who is available today? Or do you want to hire someone who's going to fix the problem forever? Right? So maybe the handyman is the cheapest person and he's available because no one else wants to hire him. But maybe, and maybe that'll solve the problem for now and if you're selling the place, maybe they, no one will even know before you sign all the papers. But if you really want it fixed properly, then maybe you don't want to gamble that way. And you may find that the prices are fairly similar too. Not so much for the handyman, but for a certain level of performance, you can go to a generalist or you can go to someone who just specializes in that area and maybe you'd want to deal with someone who you have the confidence, like the person that you trust can give you the results. Well, there would be two different solutions to the same problem. Right. Like we've had some electrical work done by a handyman and we've had some electrical work done by an electrician. And when it's really straightforward, it probably doesn't matter. but when you have an electrician, then they notice other things. Maybe it's just to jack up the bill, I don't know. But there are other things that they can fix because they're aware that this isn't really up to the code today or this is a better way of doing that. And they wouldn't really know that if they were also doing the plumbing and, and the drywall and the other things. So I would like to think that people who specialize, because I'm very specialized, so I'd like to think that people who are specialized do have an advantage when it comes to someone needing help in that particular niche. Um, this also reminds me of an expression uh, that if you want something done, go to someone who's really busy. You know, <laughs> they haven't got time to help you today, but you know that they're really busy at what they do, mm -hmm. and there's a tremendous demand on their services, so that's the person to go to. That is a good quote, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that was a good quote. I like that. So, yeah. A plumber yeah. told me that many years ago. Well, I heard it from my mentors, but now, now when you said it, it actually made sense. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, we have time for uh, a couple of other questions if someone would like to. How about the people who are listening? I want to hear what they have to say. It. Oh. The good thing is that they didn't leave. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I really. No, because I'm a big fan of active listening, but I don't need the listeners have things to say. That's my challenge to that well, side of the room. Well, I came to sort of hear from people with more expertise because I would I, I would consider doing podcasting if I had time for my product. Uh, so what is your product? Uh, 
so I sell uh, motorcycle parts online. Uh, motorcycle parts online. online. Parts. And so, you know, the blog works well. We have an online website. We have a store. Mm -hmm. So it's really just um, for a few products that are sort of very popular, how do we reach more people? Mm -hmm. So maybe a podcast. Yeah. You know, maybe just another platform to reach those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Yeah. The question would be whether audio is the right format for them, or what, if they're maybe. parts, maybe they would like to see them. Yeah. Right. And yes, video maybe might video be. Yeah. yeah. They can see, can see yeah. after yeah. see it. Yeah. Maybe a little I'm, product demo. Yeah. Video. Yeah, because I'm finding myself that, because I mean, I, I do still read, but if I want to learn something, then I find that video is just so easy. Like you just mm -hmm. go to YouTube and then <laughs> someone is actually showing you like they're clicking on this or this is the part and you like this is how you look at it, etc. That might be more compelling. Um, it's all visual learning. Yes. Like I, I wanted to change the screen on, my, on an I, iPhone, iPhone. And I wish on YouTube and there was a 15 year old kid taking the thing apart and showing how to put it together again. I was like, what you need. wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm, I actually haven't bought the screen yet, but I found the screen where they sell it. Yeah. So I have to buy it and just watch the guy do it. Wow. I was amazed. I was like, yeah, I took Very it Very specific, yeah. Yeah. It was just it's the power of a video. Do you have like, any comments from our next uh, speaker here? <laughs> yeah, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Br Mr. Brett over there. Do you have any questions on there, Brett? No, no, actually. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you love this, you, you like this presentation then? Absolutely. Um, all right, there you go. Speechless. <laughs> Speechless. <laughs> There's the answer right there. So I'm going to make a talk. How did you make your hair do that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You just woke up that way? <laughs> My That's goodness, really we have a lively audience. audience. <laughs> <laughs> but we're talking about how so many things are on YouTube. Like, I got the tripod I'm using today recently. And I went to YouTube after buying it, and I saw an unboxing where it must be like a 12-year-old kid, right? And he's explaining tripods, and it's got this, and it's got that. I'm thinking, wow, like yeah. that's. I mean, I, I managed. I had already figured out how to take the tripod out of the box myself, <laughs> but it was just interesting that this young person was passionate about tripods, <laughs> and this one had particular features that he he liked. So it's it's quite interesting. They're like the citizens, so they're like immigrants, right? Yeah. That's true. Okay, so we'll take one final question. Are you buying lunch? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, we're out of time. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. <laughs> those, that. Those fuzz happened between the the interspectral future dimension going from that side to right, that side. Right, right. Propagation delay. Yeah, yeah, there's a delay. You didn't catch that. There's some interference and in mechanisms there. <laughs> well, lunch was at noon, so you have already enjoyed your lunch. <laughs> you haven't picked up any calories, so from that point of view, that's very good. That was good, that was good. So just to summarize, a really, so you, I would suggest you consider where podcasting fits into your strategy. Because if you look at text, that is very easy to index, et cetera. And you look at video, that's very compelling. Podcast seems to be the thing in the middle where it's good for some people, but maybe it's more of a stepping stone. Because if you look at video, it casts a large shadow. Oh. oh. <laughs> okay, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> oh. Hold on, I'll take a picture of that one. I'll do it. I got that on video. It looks a little bit like Bart Simpson, too. <laughs> it looks like someone with the yeah, all the way. Uh, pipe. <laughs> so there are lots of different things that you can... Is it like one of those Rorschach, uh, you know, the, the splatter we're supposed to interpret psychologically? No, I think this is probably a wall or a ceiling or something, and this is a reflection of that. Yes. Um, so podcasting can be can be quite valuable, but just see where it fits in, and that would be great for you. Now, we are done. If you'd like to stay around while we're dismantling stuff, then you're certainly welcome to I do that. If you your autograph. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. And then we have the wrap-up session, which I believe is in room 204, just right. down the hall. Yep. So I hope you've had a great time Woo! here at PodCamp.
mind if I get your business card? Sure. Or, uh, sure. I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, that was a great presentation. Oh, no. great Thanks for attending. Yeah. Very nice to meet you. Thank you.